Hello everyone, this is Jason Su from Raylian Global Advisors. Uh, today, I'll be talking with you about applying machine learning to help you invest better in the Chinese equities market. Now, a lot has been said about machine learning. Uh, what I want to say today is that uh, machine learning doesn't just magically give you alpha. It actually takes a lot more work to make it work properly. And in fact, when it actually works properly, it mostly tells you that a lot of your alpha modeling work is, is noisy and is data mined. Now, don't be depressed by that because that's actually quite useful because only when you know how much of your work is data mined and how much is actually truly useful signal can you then really extract the signal from the noisy data and find interesting relationships to predict future stock returns. So let's take a look at how machine learning might work uh, when applied to US data. Now, if you do your research right, it's likely that when applying the technique to a very efficient market, uh, machine learning will tell you, hey, just buy the S&P 500. So where machine learning is truly interesting is applying to a very inefficient market. And in this case, China uh, would be one such market, 85% retail trading uh, and very inexperienced traders. And China happens to be quite important because it's a very large equity market, the second largest today and perhaps likely to grow to the size of the US in terms of its benchmark weight over time. So having a very large alpha reservoir is very exciting, but how do we extract that alpha from the Chinese equity market using machine learning? Well, there is a, a obstacle. Uh, it is that the Chinese equities data is very short. Uh, it's barely 15 years old. And of course, the first five years is completely uh, not, not representative of what the Chinese equity market is today. And so if you have just under 10 years of data, it's very hard to say anything. And machine learning certainly uh, needs a lot of data to really find out patterns. Now, this is where you can be clever and understand that, hey, you know, machine learning looks at data and learns about data and then predicts the future. So you can have the machine to learn about China by using US historical data, using global historical data, using historical data from other emerging economies where there were parts of that history when those markets were more inefficient, more like what China is today. So it's using US to predict China today. And the funny thing is historical US data is actually far more useful for predicting China today than it is for predicting US today because the US today is simply too efficient relative to its history. And of course, the uh, nonlinear interaction module uh, is quite useful uh, because there are specific factors and specific attributes in China that interact in interesting and non-linear ways. And when you put all that together, uh, you know, machine learning uh, can help you unlock the tremendous alpha potential that is available in the Chinese equities market. Uh, and given that the Chinese equity market uh, could likely become 20-25% of the global equity market uh, benchmark over time, that's a very, very significant way to add to the alpha of your equity portfolio. Uh, so before signing off, I'll probably leave you with one last thought, which is um, while machine learning is very sexy, don't fall in love with it too much. Do understand uh, what it actually can and cannot do. Uh, I think there's a lot of sort of misadvertisement out there. Uh, and if you really understand how it works, uh, you'll discover that uh, uh, more than anything else, it keeps you really honest on what is actually possible when investing quantitatively. All right, that concludes my formal remark. Uh, now I would like you to join me in the live stream for some Q&A. Okay, um, good day, Jason. I don't know where you are located at this moment, but I'm very glad to have you here, a live in the live stream of uh, the Financial Investigator event. We just saw your clear presentation, and I see before me here an audience, but also a team of three panelists that would like to raise some questions to you with regard to your presentation. And maybe I can ask Rainier to kick off with his questions to you. Well, I did it. Thank you for your presentation. It was uh, quite clear to us. Uh, I have a, a quite long question uh, for you. Uh, I will introduce that. Uh, for a market with generally lower standards in reporting quality and accounting integrity, uh, can the quantitative method that's completely data dependent, like machine learning, uh, still work? Given, given the level of retail market participation, you expect China to be 
a fairly inefficient market with large potential for alpha. However, the relevant historical data uh, are very short. Now my question, can machine learning still be applied to create strategies for accessing alpha in China, given the short data issue? Uh, thank you. So well, first of all, I'm actually <laughs> broadcasting in, from, from Boston. I have oh, a from virtual Boston? background. Okay, yeah. hi, <laughs> good morning. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a virtual background. This is Star Trek. <laughs> we uh, saw that. The yeah. Starship Enterprise. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So with regard to, to the question, so I, I think I want to address uh, two dimensions. One is about the shortness of data. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, if you look at the amount of data we have to analyze uh, either Chinese corporate financials or just price and volume data, at best you have 15 years. And certainly of the 15 years, probably only the last 10 years is relevant, right? Because the first five years, there was very little trading, very few companies were trading. Uh, so that is complicated uh, from a, a, any statistical methodology, much less you know, applying uh, machine learning, which really requires a large amount of data. The way to overcome that, though, is not by uh, you know, sort of staring more at the Chinese data uh, and hope somehow magically uh, uh, you, you, you could overcome the short, shortness of data problem. What you need to do is to take global data. Uh, you take data from the US, from uh, other developed Asian economies, from other emerging economies. And there the trick is, uh, the patterns you're looking for in China today has occurred before in the past, historically, in the US, uh, in, say, Taiwan, in South Korea, in Japan, right? There was a time period in the US history, in Japan's history, in Korea's history, where the market is relatively inefficient, where there's quite a bit of retail trading, and where the uh, market participants are not as skilled and exhibit uh, varying degrees of behavioral biases that you can take advantage of. And while those patterns are much weaker now in the U.S. today, in Taiwan, in Korea today, uh, they show up quite strongly in China. So this is a way of using sort of an augmented data set that is not China-specific, but yet that contains a lot of information on, say, what retail investors are likely to uh, uh, sort of commit as, as uh, mistakes in China today. So that's one way to handle the, uh, the shortness of data problem. Uh, the second dimension, uh, Again, related to data, but this time it's related to the fact that when you look at the quality of the reported financials, uh, certainly they're of a different quality, uh, you know, not quite global standards. Uh, and, and so as China is still trying to converge to uh, global standards, uh, trying to converge to global sort of auditing and best practice in governance and, and transparency, uh, you, you, you'll question the integrity of the data. Right? And, and so this is another issue with the data, right? It's not just the shortness of it, it's just the integrity. You question whether you can trust the data. Now the good news there is that this is something we actually know how to deal with, right? There is a very vast literature from uh, accounting. So it's, it's under the, uh, the, the, the research uh, banner of forensic accounting. Uh, basically, uh, you can look at you know, income statement, balance sheet, and get a sense of are the numbers uh, likely conservative or aggressive, right? Is there something weird going on there? Uh, and with machine learning, given that there's so much accounting data available, uh, both you know, from the company itself, but also other companies within the ecosystem, right? Upstream, downstream companies. Machine's actually quite good at piecing together all that data, piecing together all the accounting red flags and start to question, hey, you, know, you have amazing margin and you have amazing earnings growth, but no one else within your own industry segment in upstream or downstream exhibit the same characteristic. Something's going on there. And again, with machine learning, uh, you're much more able to pick that up versus say a human. So in conclusion, yes, you know, shortness of data is always a challenge, uh, but in this case, uh, you can be clever about it. China data is short, but the history of financial market is quite long. The history of how retail individuals misbehave and, and create alpha opportunities is quite long. And the other part is, uh, yes, uh, slightly more problematic in terms of data quality, but we know a lot from the vast accounting literature and the machine learning tools actually is quite good at sort of finding out much more subtle red flags that say a, a, a traditional fundamental analyst would struggle with. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, let me see. Hari, would you 
Yeah. I have a question for yeah. Jason. You said that uh, the Alpha from China is actually the, the, the biggest one, is maybe uh, even likely to dominate global Alpha production. Uh, is that because the China market is so big, or is it because so inefficient, this market? Hmm. Yes, so there are, again, two dimensions uh, to this. Uh, for a, a economy or market, uh, to, to be a large alpha reservoir. Uh, well, you have to, first of all, be very large within the benchmark. And second of all, you have to be very inefficient, right? So let's just take uh, the, the uh, emerging market uh, index. Uh, today, uh, you know, China, after the adjustment in the inclusion factor, uh, is likely to become uh, close to 40%. Uh, perhaps by the time of full inclusion, China's you know, market would have grown more, it might actually get closer to 50% of the emerging market. So first of all, just from a benchmark perspective, right? This is the one country within EM uh, that has the largest weight. Uh, and so, you know, if you're able to generate alpha uh, for that benchmark exposure, it's much more meaningful to outperforming the broader EM index. So first of all, that, that's really important to understand. If you want to invest in sort of resource and technology to mine alpha, uh, it's best that you invest that in a large uh, benchmark constituent. So, so you know, China does benefit from this being being so large as a capital market. But the second part is, you also need that market to be inefficient, right? Now, just because China is big doesn't mean it'll necessarily be inefficient to have lots of alpha. And you know, usually what you see is larger economy, you know, the U.S., Japan, uh, Germany tends to be more mature, and there's not a lot of alpha. So China in this case is actually quite unique. That is both large and quite inefficient. Now, it's not just any kind of inefficiency. Uh, you know, a lot of us think of inefficiency as, oh, well, you know, if it's a young country that doesn't have robust financial institutions, that probably doesn't have uh, very sophisticated regulators, it's inefficient. But we actually need something that's a little tighter uh, in terms of what we talk about inefficiency. This is really uh, about the supply of alpha, right? So uh, a market could be very inefficient, but if it doesn't have a lot of trading, uh, doesn't have a lot of retail individuals who, who are you know, speculating and making mistakes, well, there, there's um, not a lot of alpha to be had, right? Because at the end of the day, alpha is a zero-sum game, right? You've got to have a lot of people on the other side of your alpha trade. And generally, they have to be inexperienced uh, retail individuals who trade a lot. Uh, again, in China, you have 80 85% retail trading. So that's, that's the good news. That's a large reservoir. So you got a very large benchmark weight that has 85% sort of speculative, uh, uninformed trading, and that really anchors the source of, of alpha. Uh, and particularly in the context of machine learning, it tends to pick off a sort of repeatable pattern, so much more sort of behavioral patterns than, say, just, you know, random uh, uh, shock to policies or uh, to, to market cycles. So the fact that it's quite retail individual and therefore quite uh, more sort of behavioral bias-based alpha is, is the other good news for uh, for people who are applying the uh, machine learning technique okay. uh, to mine alpha in that market. Thank you, Jason. Maybe Ham, do you have another question for Jason? Yeah, uh, Jason, I, I can understand machine learning works very well with identifying pictures or maybe even driving a car, that a machine can drive a car. But financial markets is a different animal in the sense that uh, humans interact and humans adapt. And if I know that your machine is active in this market, I maybe try to front run your machine and maybe interact with other uh, people and trying to uh, understand what's happening. And by, by that, I'm creating a lot of noise maybe for your machine. And the difficulty then for your machine is how to identify a pattern. Maybe they identify patterns that are really not there so that the machine does not work. Yes, so while I'm a big champion of the technology and, and, and a heavy user of technology, uh, I think I'm also very realistic about what that technology can and cannot do. Uh, and you're absolutely right. Like, when we talk about machine learning, don't, don't make it, you know, some kind of magical black box that just solve problems that we humans can't solve. Uh, it is actually quite limited in what it can do. There, there's a few things it does well, which is detecting patterns that repeat. But outside of that, it really doesn't uh, do do very much, right? So if you're talking about a pattern that doesn't exist, right? Machine learning is completely hopeless. So you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, financial markets is filled with patterns that that have never been seen before, right? So if you're asking machine learning to uh, help us understand, well, what should asset prices look like in a world of negative interest rate? Sorry, the machine can't tell you that because we never had 
negative interest rates before, right? Uh, it, it can't predict uh, COVID-19 and it can't predict what's likely to happen to asset prices after COVID-19. Again, this is something that didn't exist in data. So it's really important to understand. It's about patterns that repeat. Yeah. Now, of course, once you see a pattern with a machine, how do you know that pattern is going to repeat, right? Like you say, uh, some of it uh, could be uh, just an accident, right? Uh, so that comes from this uh, data mining. Now, the good news about machine learning is uh, part of the toolkit is actually quite skeptical. So built into the machine learning is these tools that says, look, if you stare at data long enough, you'll find something. And so we're going to be very distrustful of data uh, uh, patterns. Uh, so you, you, either it's a lot of data and then very robust pattern, or we're not going to give a lot of weight to it. So the other thing that you're more likely to fall prey to is something that actually is a robust uh, pattern, uh, but it, it's, it will decay, right? Like you say, you know, we, we, we are intelligent uh, traders and when we see a pattern, we pounce on it and the pattern goes away, that's how markets work. Uh, and so that's actually the, the most dangerous thing, right? Your machine sees a pattern, but doesn't realize that uh, mm. other investors uh, will discover it and will arbitrage that out. And so this is where you actually, again, you want to be clever about it. So you want to use, say, U.S. data, and you say, ah, look, you know, uh, a lot of uh, signals about uh, uh, accounting fraud. Uh, and, and those patterns, you know, existed in the late 70s, early 80s, and they've gone away. Uh, and so, you know, you, you machine can, able, can then say, oh, there's sort of decay to that. And now you can apply that to uh, South Korea. You can apply that to other emerging markets, apply that to China, and you say, hey, you know, assuming that kind of decay rate, given in the last few years you saw very large alpha to uh, sort of forensic accounting signals, how long do we ex ex expect that alpha to last and how fast will it decay? So you don't make too big of a, a, a bet down at expecting the exact pattern to repeat. So you're now actually a little bit more intelligent. You know that pattern will repeat, but just with lower intensity. And that information comes from, again, looking at uh, data that's not China. Okay. That's good. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Um, we just uh, also received a, a question online via chat, and I will put that up to you. Um, given that noise needs to be filtered and main signals are to be extracted, how is machine learning different from human pattern recognition? Ah, so, yes. So, any kind of pattern recognition, whether a human, whether it's a machine, uh, all work the same way, right? It, it's right. a matter of their signal and then there are a lot of noise. And in fact, the noise often dominates the signal. Uh, the benefit, of course, having a human is human can apply theory yeah. when it looks at uh, you know, patterns, say, oh, is that pattern or is that noise? Uh, machine right now can't, uh, at least for financial markets where we're, uh, the noise is so high, uh, you know, machine actually often gets fooled or, or just gets swamped by the noise. So yeah. but we're very much still in the realm of, say, uh, called guided learning, right? So you actually apply a lot of uh, uh, human intuition and say, this signal makes sense. It's behavioral yeah. in nature or it is a risk in nature. You see that's the machine and the machine starts to work from there. So it's still very much a collaboration between man and yeah, machine. But, 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 yeah, it's still it's for a big part human work. It remains it's human work. It's a lot of human work. Yeah. It's a lot of human work. Then I have one question uh, that I, for myself to you, and it is, are there examples of successful investing in China equities through uh, machine learning already? Uh, so. Uh, so I would say, um, first of all, you know, uh, machine learning so far has been probably a lot more marketing than it is uh, great success, right? You know, we, we, we have not created a machine that uh, uh, is, is a rival to, to a warm Buffett yet, I'd just say. Right, yeah, right. Uh, but, but if you want to say, okay, where has success been? I think success yeah. has been in two domains. Right. Uh, one is quite predictable, which is in the very short high-frequency domain, uh, where you're essentially market making, right? Where you're 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 you know trying to front run liquidity, uh, um, you know trying to front run shift in market depth. That's proven out to work because there's a lot more data, right? Tick by tick data. So in China, um, if you're a high frequency guy, uh, it's it's been a very very fertile hunting ground, uh, okay. far more so than than in the U.S. market because less competition. So that's where we've seen big very big success. The other success you're going to be surprised by is. When you apply machine learning to China, all of a sudden your back test uh, no longer have a sharp ratio of eight, right? Your, your, your sharp ratio now goes down yeah. to something that's still fantastic and, but quite believable. It's closer to two, two and a half. Yeah. So that's another feature of uh, machine learning that people don't sort of pay attention to, which is it gives you an honest back test. Yeah. So you can credibly 
understand what's possible and right. as you're optimizing your portfolio, you don't make unreasonable concentrated bets. Right. Uh, and then I think that is very clear. And uh, sorry yeah. that I have to <laughs> interrupt yeah. you due to the time frame, the slot where we're into. Uh, thanks again, Jason. It was really a pleasure to have you here. And um, I told the public, uh, the audience, that, uh, that they will receive your presentations afterwards. Thank you very much.